Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, the show that should be a lot of fun, probably will be a lot of fun. I'm Gavin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and it's Friday, July the 12th, 2019. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. We're going to have a lot of fun here today, but before we do, I need you to do some things for us, and that's like the program, share the program, subscribe to the program. If you want to listen to the podcast, do the YouTube show notes, and there's a link to the podcast, and please comment on the program. That's where a lot of this gets tashed out by you, the viewer, the fun viewer who really have lots of opinions, and we appreciate that, we do. I need to make a correction. Um, I was gonna do it last week, but the topic was too difficult. We talked about Jonathan Fletcher. I was gonna do it the week before, but that was an interview with Archbishop Foley. Didn't really seem appropriate to to uh, do a correction there, so it's correction. I did a uh, a Anglican scripted two weeks ago with Jeff Walton, and Jeff Walton offhandedly said, hey, by the way, uh, we were at the services and it seemed like they were not using the new prayer book for the opening and closing Eucharist. And um, he had heard, discovered that for himself and heard that from another person and related on the program. That was in error. I heard right away from three or four people, what are you talking about? Of course it was the um, same uh, Eucharist that was in the new prayer book, Kevin. Please make a correction. Here's the correction in our apology for making such an offhanded, weird comment. That's what we do here. We're going to give a quick update on Jonathan Fletcher. Uh, you're the Englishman over there. Gavin, what's going on? I received a letter from uh, a very reputable person who used to teach at a major public school, a man in his 80s. He's uh, uh Wrote, wrote me privately simply saying you don't realize how powerful the body is that is behind Ewan and um, uh, and now the Titus Trust. Um, here are some things that happened when I was heavily involved in it. Uh, you ought to hold yourself ready for some very powerful people in society to exercise as much leverage as they can to make sure that none of the victims gets to say anything. Don't hold your breath. One of the things that was supposed to be happening this Sunday was that the Sunday Times, with an excellent reporter called Nicholas Helen, was going to try and to break the surface with some victim testimony. We hear it may not happen. My correspondent may have been right. If that's the case, um, we should let the whole thing drop from our point of view. We are not, in fact, sex obsessed, as one or two of our commentators have said what what we're finding is we have a, a society that is sex obsessed and a church that has not managed to organize its priorities in the way that we're called to do as Christians uh, and we're trying to tell the truth about it. Other people who ought to be committed to the truth appear in fact committed to saving their reputations and not telling the truth. That will be a theme that comes through the program later on in other areas of the, our commentary as well. It seems that nobody is victim obsessed. Very yeah. true, Kevin. I mean, our, the, the victim that I've been talking to has at the end declined not to allow his story to go forward at this time. And the various pressures being brought to bear upon him, internal and external pressures. Now, but that does not mean the story is over. Because at the end of the day, the real story is not the story of the bad acts of one man. Though as important as that man is and was in the life of the conservative evangelical community, his bad acts are not the true story. The true story is the culture that it surrounds and has grown up uh, in this of uh, in this English uh, evangelical world of corruption and cover up, of not of knowing but saying nothing, of by keeping silent, condoning abuse, condoning a perversion of the gospel. Um, one of our correspondents has gone through one of Jonathan Fletcher's books of uh, John Smythe, excuse me, John Smythe, the original beating, uh, the original monster from a I were a Ewern camp. Ewern. And in looking at his talks, the man teaches heterodox Christianity. These little boys uh, who 20, 30 years ago were being beaten were also having their heads filled with poison 
that poisons their Christian souls. And this is such a, so much bigger. Uh, well, remember the fun we used to, the, the used to be said about Richard Nixon? It wasn't a two-bit burglary. It was the cover-up It was uh, at the end of the day. Mm. And this is what we're seeing. So in one sense, the story is not going to be as salacious at this time. I'm fairly confident that we'll, we'll eventually get someone to break ranks and share with the secular press or with the church press their uh, personal encounter that they will swear to with names, dates, places. Now, uh, but, right, but right now, the big story is still progressing, which is investigating the links and the cover-ups and the who knew what and when. And why did you keep silent in the face of criminal, immoral, heretical conduct? In the pre-show, Gavin, you mentioned that... Uh, a blog had called us a, a certain name about a uh, <laughs> last wine in the cellar. I, I, I wasn't sure what it was. What uh, was it? Kevin, go on. Yeah, well, uh, let's talk about some of the response to uh, Anglican Unscripted. Personal, uh, personal uh, attacks. <laughs> Uh, there's a very funny t English television program called The Last of the Summer Wine, which is a, mm. a wonderful send-up of rural people of highly limited intelligence and pretty narrow scope of interest and uh, contains particularly a trio of old men. Uh, since uh, And the oldest of all is the smelliest, most stupid and disreputable. So that clearly is me. <laughs> anyway, so, so someone has said we are the ecclesiastical equivalent. Um, and, and hurt as that might slightly... Uh, it's modified by the fact this was an enormously popular, popular television <laughs> show that people were very happy to watch for some time. Um, but I think probably if we're being insulted, it's a very good sign. I like, like so many critics in the past, I would so much, I think it was Oscar Wilde particularly, who had a pithy way of putting it, I'd much rather be insulted than ignored. Well, if Archbishop Justin Welby has to take any hypertension medicine at all, it's because of this program. And we're going to add another Archbishop to that. Archbishop of York has made the news this last two weeks, and I thought we could talk about that. First of all, because I have a bishop here on the program. Bishop Gavin Asherton is married to a wonderful wife. Have you ever considered just ordaining her out of the blue and saying, you're a deacon? Well, you know, Kevin, if she asked me, um, I would. You and, would uh, of course. The only reason I haven't <laughs> done it is because she hasn't asked me and because if she if she asked me and said would you ignore all practice and all protocol and all fairness to those candidates who've come through the normal route of discernment and haven't looked for uh, any particular prestige patronage or, or, or favors um ignore them and make me a special case well of course i do it like a shot kevin because i'm committed to the interests of my family before i'm committed to the church jesus and due process it's obvious isn't it yeah it seems to be Something we need to talk about with the Archbishop of York, George. Tell us well, the story. Well, it, it like in the Episcopal Church and the ACNA and other uh, traditional denominations, there's an ordination process. There is a process. Uh, Church of England takes three years uh, of training at a theological college. And before you even go to a theological college, you go before various boards and committees and whatnot. The same with the Episcopal Church, same with the ACNA and so on and so forth. And then finally, at the end of the process, the bishop lays hands on you and you're made a deacon and you're sent off into the great wide world. Well, in May, uh, a Margaret Santamu was approved for ordination without having gone through the committee process of several years and without having gone to theological college. And whereas it takes th six months, uh, three years, for, in her case, it was six weeks between starting the process and being made a deacon. And she will be ordained a priest on her husband's last day of office next summer. And she's been assigned as a curate to her husband's chaplain, John Day. So, but the also thing is that after she is ordained a priest, she'll be 69 and a half years old. So she'll have six months in which to complete theological college and to serve her ministry before she's retired due to the age limits of the ministry this is crazy i i when you guys told me the story i was looking for where's the benefit is there a financial gain is there you know is she going to get a pension right away what how why it just it doesn't make any sense to me what well, am i missing well, here as a matter of history margaret sentimu has uh, worked at the highest levels of the church. She's run 
many of the selection conferences for other people to, to discern whether or not they should be priests. Clearly, at the last moment, she feels she should be a priest. The, pro the problem is, it, it, if, even if it's something else, and it may be, we haven't been told, perhaps we should offer the Archbishop of York the right to reply. Absolutely. It looks like corruption and nepotism. Jo Kevin and George, the reason I, I, I feel this very strongly at the moment is because I've been watching the ICSA recordings again, and uh, the ICSA are the Independent uh, Review of Child Abuse. And yesterday they interviewed both uh, the Archbishops of Canterbury and York. Um, the Archbishop, and also they gave testimony to a very brave man called Matthew Ineson. Matthew is a, is a priest and a victim of rather nasty abuse from a clergyman who killed himself before he was due to go to trial. What's moving about, uh, and the reason that the proximity of these things to one another matters, is that, that, that Matthew Anderson yesterday on video said, uh, accused both Welby and Sentamu of, of utter gross hypocrisy. He said, I look to see the face of Jesus Christ in you, my archbishops, and I see nothing of the kind. I see rank hypocrites. We have asked you time and time and time again for help, for recognition, for protection, for justice and all you have done is protect your institution and at the same time when Welby was being so, so Sentamu was asked had he done anything wrong ever in this matter had he ever fallen below standards that might have been ideal and he shook his head and said no and then a reporter followed into his car and said you know you have had some very serious accusations put to you archbishop do you have anything to say and he simply replied no comment no comment no comment Welby was asked about his own behaviour when he was Dean of Liverpool. There was a troubled person who had been abused, he thought, by somebody who was involved with the cathedral. Welby's response was to ban him from the premises and make sure security kept him out. Uh, and he had this common sense to, when asked if he could have done anything better to say, well, yes, perhaps I might have done. But whilst he was a senior manager let us use those terms of deans in the church of england he appears to have behaved quite as badly as anybody else now if we go back to the beginning of the show the one thing christianity can't manage is hypocrisy uh, we're all sinners we're all flawed we all make mistakes um and the wonderful thing about the faith that we share and and, and the jesus we follow is we get to repent but if you don't repent you're in such trouble and there is no evidence the people running the church of england have any intention of repenting or saying sorry and if you see this very moving testimony by matthew ennison well it's heartbreaking mm. is it is it on the youtube yet can we set, put a link into it in the show notes yeah it is all right good. one of the things that ennison said is that he did everything right in the sense of, of following the protocols and guidelines set down by the Church of England. There were four or five bishops, including, uh, involved in his case. Sentamu received written notifications. Sentamu was fully involved in the process. And Sentamu testified, well, he thought that somebody else would take care of this. And it was always somebody else's problem. It was always somebody else's issue to deal with. And the... Uh, I don't see how the reputation of the Church of England could get any worse than it has been. I mean, it's not a very strong, healthy institution. But when you have this flagrant disregard of uh, abuse that we saw uh, in the Innocent case, of one of its own, Innocent is a priest of the Church of England. He's not somebody on the outside seeking to destroy the institution. This is one of their own whom they sacrificed to... Uh, for con the convenience sake, so as not to rock the boat. In, in some respects, it's the same story as the Fletcher case, except we're different tribes within the uh, Church of England. Uh, the conservative evangelicals don't uh, populate the House of Bishops, but the same indifference, the same cover-up, the same culture of not rocking the boat that I'm experiencing in uh, reporting on the Fletcher case is what Innocent is testifying to uh, with Welby and Sintamu. And it goes on and on and on. Um, how, these, how these people can hold their head up and proclaim themselves to be Christian leaders when they have failed the very people whom they have been called to serve and protect is beyond me. Uh, that these men have no shame. They have no integrity. 
I remember what I thought was a bad day for the Church of England, uh, certainly Archbishop of Canterbury, was the day that I heard Rowan Williams became a Druid. Now I kind of look back on those days with fondness. <laughs> you know, I guess that, you know, that was a silly story compared to the hypocrisy, you know, and outright dishonesty we have going on now at the upper levels of Church of England uh, administration. It's it's. I've always, uh, I've always been looked askance at people who talk about conspiracies, but there certainly feels almost like a Freemasonry of sorts, Jeez. that there is an inner circle of the elect mm -hmm. that cannot be touched no matter what they do. Well, it's, but it's not just that. When they do take an action, it's completely inept. So um, there's a past cases review is set up to look at non-action for victims before a certain period of time. And someone has just reviewed the review, and it, and uh, the, the the private eye uh, give an example of of, of what happened um, between two thousand and seven and nine. The Church of England conducted an independent review of cases of non recent abuse. It was published in two thousand and ten, and announced any concerns about a member of clergy um, have been thoroughly examined in the light of current best practice. Actually, it was full of cover ups and cock ups. In 2017, Sir Roger Singleton, an independent assessor, brought in by the church to review the review, described it as botched. Some dioceses had lost or destroyed files on abusive clergy. The lost or abusive, the, the king of a lost and lost files is Centimo, of course, um, in in the, the so-called floods at, at York. Uh, at least 16 had underreported cases for concern. Uh, some bishops had chosen to conduct the review internally instead of employing independent scrutineers. The church announced that the, the, the responses from seven of the 42 dioceses were so inadequate after Singleton, they had to repeat the exercise from scratch. So they've just appointed somebody at a salary of hundred thousand pounds a year to try and get them to, 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 to improve their behavior. So, uh, and what, what do they do then? Well, they, they take one of the liberal bishops who's a member of the club, the Bishop of Lincoln, and overnight, um, they make him a victim too by saying, you're sacked now, you're, you're suspended. And when he says, but I haven't done anything wrong, the answer is, well, we need a victim of some kind to show that we're taking matters seriously. So welcome to the victim club. It, if they had said, now you know how it feels, it might have had some moral value to it, but they don't even just say, say I'll do that. Let's transition a little bit. Lambeth 2020. I think the most important thing that Archbishop of Canterbury and those who are hosting the next Lambeth need to do is take apart Lambeth 110. Make it mean nothing. Make sure that what it meant before does not mean what it means now. And be sure that the, the Anglican Communion knows it's not the theology of the Anglican Communion. Now, I've seen Justin Welby say that on paper, and now I kind of hear um, the Archbishop of York speaking that way in a recent sermon. I thought we could uh, uh, talk about that, the, trying to get rid of Lambeth 110. Professor Stephen Knoll, a friend of this broadcast, he's been on several times, mm -hmm. uh, did a critique or a fisking of Johnson Tamu's address to the General Synod, um, where essentially St. Tamu said that uh, there is, he, he did the Pontius Pilate, what is truth? Uh, you have your truth, I have my truth. Um, and therefore we should honor each other's truths even though they're, <laughs> yeah, they're diametrically opposed. Um, this is the blueprint uh, for uh, the future of the Anglican world, that we will stick together by agreeing not to agree and agreeing not there are no standards and agreeing that the only thing that holds us together is our mutual haberdashers. What, what he did specifically was to say that we have a problem uh, that we don't walk in each other's shoes. In other words, we've, we've got disagreement and we don't understand how each other feels. And then we have another problem, and that is that we don't understand how society feels. Uh, and, and in this wonderful, big, rich, mixed economy of multi-experience, uh, we need to take both these things into concern, consideration. Because one thing he's not doing is saying we have the Holy Scriptures and Holy Tradition, and they say that certain things are completely off limits. And it doesn't matter uh, how other people read them with their vested interests, and it doesn't matter how a secularized, sexualized society reads them. There ought to be, it's, it's about 
epistemology. It's about where you locate authority. So to begin the whole thing by abandoning the authority of scripture and tradition uh, is, is, as George says, to prepare the way for an entirely different set of criteria to establish the church's understanding of sexuality uh, and, and, and obedience to, to moral virtue. What are the, and speaking about why do, why does the third world, the growing world, the two-thirds world, however you wish to describe it, why do they put up with this? Uh, we had recent statements by the Archbishop of Kenya on this point, where the Kenyan government is pressured by the U.S., ha, had been pressured by the Obama yeah. administration, is being pressured by the May government and international NGOs to change its laws on, so, their sodomy laws is what they're called, and I'm not being pejorative when I use those terms the laws on homosexuality. And so they, they get government pressure and they look at the Church of England as being sort of a, a negotiator, a stance between a hard left British foreign policy that seeks to undermine what the, some many of the African churches believe to be their cultural, cultural uh, integrity. And they look for the Archbishop of Canterbury and, and he'll help here, he'll help there, he'll get the chapel in Algiers for instance, the, the, the Diocese of Egypt's church had been uh, given to the Church of England by a disgruntled, had been given to the English government as an embassy chapel by a disgruntled uh, parish council. And it took 25 years, but finally uh, Welby got the foreign office to give it back to the Diocese of Egypt. And so people, so the churches of Burundi, the, uh, met, uh, Central Africa, West Africa, many of these places that feel they need the influence of an advocate in the halls of power in London or Washington, they basically kowtow to the Archbishop of Canterbury. When it doesn't matter, when it's an issue that doesn't affect them economically or culturally, they're fully on board the GAFCON movement. But otherwise, they sort of have to play ball with Canterbury for non-theological reasons. I think one of the things that, that again, adds a degree uh, of, of a profound concern to this is just at the moment in English society we're fighting some very serious battles. There have been two individuals, uh, one Felix Nagoli, who is a social worker, uh, who was thrown off his course and told he couldn't become a social worker because he quoted the Bible in terms of homosexuality, and another, a, a doctor, a general practitioner, who's just been sacked because he refuses to use the pronoun that a transgendered person might, in theory, hasn't done yet, puts in front of him. He made a very interesting comment when he was being interviewed on television saying, if you get rid of all doctors with moral consciences, you're going to have, you'll be very badly served indeed by the medical profession. Uh, and, and fortunately, three judges in the Court of Appeal, in this case by Felix Nagoli, backed by Christian Concern, have said that an institution is not entitled to discriminate against people on the grounds of supposed offence taken by people they've never even met. And where has the Church of England been on these two enormously important issues of freedom of speech, freedom of moral consciousness, conscience uh, and, and Christian obedience? Absolutely silent. It's one thing, obviously, for Christian concern to defend people who are being uh, accused of having faith or being homophobic or using scripture or believing in Jesus or preaching on the streets. But whatever happened to the Church of England standing up for these people, when you walk into court, it's great to have Christian concern there, but boy, if I could have my bishop behind me helping defend this, that would be awful cool. And yet, all I see the, do the Church of England doing is throwing these people you know, to the wind. We don't, yeah, we're not gonna really defend him. Well, let, let me just uh, push this even further. Uh, Philip uh, Mount Stephen, Bishop of Truro, just released a paper which had been commissioned by the foreign minister jeremy hunt on christian persecution worldwide and there's a lot of good in this paper but at the same time there's a lot that's really really bad for instance hunt talks about christian persecution in the middle east citing iraq and syria and he blames it on the arab israeli crisis well the reason for the christian persecution in iraq and syria is western policies the policies of the u.s and Britain and France, who over who basically decided let's upset the whole apple cart and recreate uh, peace and democracy in our own image in these countries. And the result has been the catastrophic, perhaps inevitable extinction of Christianity and much of its original founding foundations. 
got nothing to do with the Arab-Israeli crisis. It's got to do with George Bush and Tony Blair and company. And, so, yet, and yet the paper being put out repeats the old bromise that the U.S. and the British governments are always right and never wrong and they can do nothing wrong. And this takes us back to Centermoon because the, the position of the Church of England is, is a relativistic one. We all have to live together in a multicultural society. We don't appear to believe our truth is more important than your truth, not even when they come into head-on collision with each other. And it's this head-on collision that's taking place that ought to alert the Church of England that the, rev the revelation that we have, the, the, the relationship with God that we're called to, the picture of God, the, human, the Christian anthropology, is being denied and threatened by others. And if, if you don't stick up for that, it doesn't matter how far you walk in somebody else's shoes. You're not doing Christianity and, and you won't survive with any integrity in a contested culture. If anybody in church leadership ever starts their sentence with all things being equal, run. Okay, that's, that's just that, that's the beginning of a, a statement that's going to start a heresy. Um, as you can tell, it's raining here. Can you guys picking that up on your feed? Good, so it's, it's, it's quiet enough. We can continue on. Last topic of the day is the seal of confession. Now, for some priests, this is do or die. We're going to have the seal or we're not going to have confession at all. For some other priests, they're like, well, of course I would turn them in. And uh, it's interesting. It's not quite as much vitriol as you have with the prayer book uh, and the different varieties of prayer book, but it's interesting to see how different priests... Uh, feel about the seal of confession i think george and gavin you guys had the same vibe here actually we have the opposite vibe i thought so cool <laughs> oh, <do we>? okay <laughs> who's gonna go for that? <laughs> so let's start off with george um george you kind of feel that the seal of confession it's there it's not Private there, no big deal confession is on anglican right it's an innovation of that was brought back in the Oxford movement, it is almost completely absent from the practice of the Episcopal Church. There are a few Anglo-Catholics here and there who do it. For the vast majority, 90 to 95 percent of clergy in the United States will never hear a formal confession. So, and my, and I'm not particularly upset by that. Uh, but that having been said, I respect those who hold it to be inviolate. I would not compel them to do that, uh, to violate what they believe to be uh, their bounden duty and honor. But you have to realize this is not, the Anglican Church of Australia has already let go of the seal of confession, uh, saying that they must already do this. And other churches will uh, do that as well. So it, from the evangelical perspective, this is a non-issue. Uh, yeah, because yeah. we shouldn't be doing it anyway, just as you shouldn't <laughs> be having benediction of the Holy Sacrament or all this stuff. Well, some people are going to do it. We'll close our eyes to it and not get that upset. But so it, it's not properly well, okay, part of the now, Anglican tradition in an evangelical perspective. Gavin, let me transition to you. At least once a year, I think last year it's once every two years, I open my prayer book before my priest. I go to the, the confessional and we do the confession. One, I need it. But I'm not spouting anything that would get me thrown in jail. Um, how important is the seal of confession in your eyes? It's absolutely essential, but it's not about the seal of confession, of course. It's, it's, about, it's because if you observe the seal of confession, you're keeping faith with God. Um, if, let me come at this a slightly different route. Of course, I agree with everything that George says. The, mm. There is something, uh, Anglicanism is both the best and the worst of Christianity. Uh, it's the worst of Christianity when it's a parody of other traditions. It's the best when it keeps faith. One of the things the Oxford movement did was to read the fathers and to get in touch with uh, uh, the deeper roots. The reason I hear confessions is not a doctrinal one. It was because I was invited onto retreats with Catholics and Orthodox, and everyone was invited to make their confession, and I felt very awkward about it. I discovered something really quite astonishing. As people came to me to confess their relative little sins, a lot to do with sex and pride and not much else, I found the Holy Spirit telling me things about their lives, which I was really surprised at. And when I passed on what the Holy Spirit had said, people were shocked, delighted, healed and greatly blessed. And I thought, oh my goodness, 
this thing works as a spiritual discipline, as a spiritual charism. This is good. Uh, frankly, I, I hate it because I have to wait on the Lord, desperate for the Holy Spirit to show up and wondering what an idiot I'll look and how much I'll let people down if he doesn't. But he always does so far. Now, why does why does the seal matter? The seal matters because the state says we don't trust you to deal with this moral issue within the economy of what you believe. So you must therefore make yourself accountable to a state official. Now, of course, the fact is we don't need state officials to make ourselves morally accountable or morally productive or faithful. We have we have the greatest source of moral probity. And if somebody has done something most seriously wrong, you can't make any progress at all without them becoming accountable for, for to, to themselves, to what they've done, to God and to anyone they've wounded. It's an absolute no brainer, therefore, that the seal of the, the, the confessional is not a place where you get away with stuff. It's a place where you put it right. But we don't need to be told by the police or by civil servants that they are the highest source of authority in this because they're not. God is. But obey God and everything else gets put right. Now, the idea that the, the, idea that the church doesn't understand this and instead says, we will act as civil servants, as magistrates for the thought police, the moral police, uh, and not preserve the integrity of the intimacy of relationship between the Father through the Son and by the Spirit is a church that's sold out and has become secularized religion. It's no good. You can't do it. Oddly enough, I agree with just about everything that Gavin did. Just, said. You nailed it. But, Both but, of you did. But let, let me just take it from my perspective. We had um, it's the relationship between the church and the state. Now, if I were given the performance of the Church of England, uh, over these uh, child abuse issues, I don't think it's a reasonable request to say we don't trust you people to get your act together. Uh, that, but Church that's not an issue we'll, we'll solve yeah. here. Let me give you a historical analogy uh, from the uh, Diocese of Florida. Uh, it used to be that marriage, you know, I, um, up until a few years ago, I could not perform a same-sex marriage, even if the church wanted to, because the state of Florida did not permit it. When the U.S. Supreme Court overturned that rule, uh, then it fell back into the diocese and Central Florida, there are no gay marriages. Southeast Florida, there are gay marriages, so on and so on and so forth. Well, we used to have similar laws, and that was on race. We had what were called miscegenation laws. The state of Florida, up until I believe the late mid-1950s, you could not, a black and a white could not legally marry. And therefore, the Episcopal Church, as an agent of the state in performing marriages, could not perform that marriage because it was uh, contrary to the law of the land. Well, what did the Episcopal Church do? Well, they married black and white people who wanted to get married. They just omitted checking the bo color box. <laughs> In other words, the, the this issue of state control is always going to be with us. Now, this misogynation thing is something we all may roll our eyes with and go giggle, giggle, ha, ha, uh, how dumb those people were in the past. But we, but human nature doesn't really change my one of my objections is to the sort of seal confession group is that the people loudly proclaiming it in my experience have been young priests with a great deal of pride and no experience of humanity and they don't quite understand what the in other words this is something that what they can be very prideful about and that this is a possession of theirs and then they that they would rather be burnt at the stake well, where I'm coming from is that, you know, you live in a fallen, broken world, and if you put your pride first, and if you put the rules first, and you put all these things first without seeking the spirit and the will of God, no matter which way you turn on this issue, you're going to screw up. I think that's right. And the, the, the idea of state control takes us back to the, the, the problem the Church of England is in. One of the things that has happened recently, if we can move segue from from, oh, absolutely. from, from the seal of confession to, to the issue of how the church relates to the state, which is another sub theme we've been dealing with so far. And one of the things that happened at General Synod was a, a, an excellent woman called Prudence Daly, um, who's a who's a, a clever and honourable uh, lady who holds the Church of England to account very often single-handed for its stupidities. And as a layperson, probably has the coolest name in all. <laughs> she does indeed. Just, you know uh, and is held in huge respect by so many people. Prudence asked a question and said to the Church of England, uh, "If two, uh, if if you." 
are presented with a couple who are married and one of them transitions and becomes different gender. So they're now they're, they were a man and woman, but they're now two men. Are they married? And the answer to the Church of England said, well, yes, because we followed a, a, a state provision that recognizes transitioning gender legally in 2004. So yes, they're married. In which case, Prusin Staley comes back and says, well, you have just established the basis for gay marriage. Two men can be legally married together in the Church of England. It's just that the ceremony had to precede the transitioning rather than happen afterwards. Is this a consistent position to have when you say you're against gay marriage? Uh, in, in other words, you won't marry people who are two men or two women before that. And of course, it isn't a consistent position. How, therefore, have you made this, got yourself into this stupid contradictory mess? Answer instead of listening to the church and tradition, we have followed state legislation. So it's not just the seal of confessional. At the very heart of all this, you cannot have a church that allows the state to dictate doctrine and practice, whether it's confession or marriage. But see, the wonderful thing about this answer is that it infuriated the transgender activists because they yes. heard it to say that, <laughs> well, right. there is no such thing as transgenderism. You can legally change your documents. You can legally have you can have these operations to uh, desex yourself, but you're still what you were before all of this occurred. Yeah. So the Church of England simultaneously said gay marriage is fine, and transgenderism is a mental illness that we take no notice of because the sacraments of you being a man and a woman are, are greater. So that really irritated some of the activists on the left. Yeah, but, but aren't they? But they're saying that if you you follow the whole argument from the Church of England, it's mentally ill for two same-sex people to want to get married. However, if they end up married afterwards, they are again. But see, the thing Ill. is, Kevin, it, there is not an argument to follow. I don't no, know. No, it's it, it's there is, uh, no, there's no logical sequence. In other words, they manage to hold mutually con. They hold contradictory positions simultaneously that their transgenderism isn't real uh gay marriage is real gay marriage is illegal and transgenderism is acceptable they hold all four positions simultaneously because, because they have I given up because they have given up the christian position and the secular position has changed every few years and each time it's changed they've adopted it and lo and behold it's contradictory you cannot uh, you cannot allow the church to define, you cannot, you cannot allow the state to define your morality and your theology and your Christian anthropology. So, Church of England, it's time to disestablish yourself in spirit, if not in law. People say, long live the Queen all the time. Nobody ever says, long live the Church of England. Guys, it's been a wonderful Friday. We're up to 41 minutes. So. <laughs> That's too long, Kevin. <laughs> I know. My, my critics well, tell me that, that the last of some of the wine doesn't last that long. No. And we're not as entertaining as they are. We need to cut it back a bit, I think. I, I'll do some slice and dice. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. And I think you've been listening to episode 500 and either 18 or 19. 19, 519 on the 12th of July, 2019. I should have put my 19s together. It would have been unforgettable. Thank you for your patience. We need your... We are, we are old wine, guys.